on Tabletop have teamed up with Games Workshop, Cyanide Studio, and Focus Home Interactive to bring you the very exciting Space Hulk Tactics Hobby Challenge. All you have to do is come across to OnTabletop.com, create a project, anything related to Space Hulk, it could be a story, painting project, or whatever you can imagine. And you could be in with the chance of winning the great Space Hulk Tactics video game and an actual copy of Space Hulk 3rd Edition. We have a load of prizes, a load of categories. Come across and check it out. Hello and welcome to The Weekender. That's better. Welcome, guys. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Time to get stuck in to find out what is going on in the world of gaming. Mm -hmm. Right. Some stuff to bring you up to speed on. First things first, and um, by far, um, uh, I would say the most important thing yes. is judging is underway mm -hmm. in the Space Hulk Tactics Challenge, okay? Um, uh, so all the projects, you guys are amazing, by the way, yeah. on the projects. Yeah. I hope you've had a blast. I really do hope you've had some fun because that's the whole purpose of the, the the challenges and stuff that we run is to give you an opportunity to just absorb yourself in your hobby yeah we've we have a, a panel of judges uh, so we've taken into account nominations mm -hmm. and the panel of judges and they've awarded points as well so we um will be on tuesday at 5 p.m gmt we'll be putting out a dedicated video looking through and announcing the winners of each category. Yeah. Um, we've just given ourselves just a little bit of extra time because there's a lot of them. And man, you guys deserve, you all deserve to be winners because it, the diversity even in the projects is well, superb. It, there's some brilliant stuff going on in there. I spent pretty much all of this Tuesday reading through each of the short story ones mm -hmm. and going through those. Some really good ideas. Yeah, coming through in those stories. It's fantastic. Okay, guys, so stay stay tuned for that Tuesday, December fourth at five p.m. In this episode, remember that you can win one of three Rampart pledges yeah. with um, Beasts of War shields. That um, uh, Regent shields that you'll you'll be able to stick yeah. on to the. Mm -hmm. If you've ever wanted to make the place look like B O W H Q. Because our HQ is exactly like that, sort of gothic architecture oh. stuck with <laughs> BOW logos everywhere. Absolutely. If I had, if we had our chance, we'd be sticking BOW shields everywhere. Uh, uh, that's our HQ, exactly like that. The Can Incan I just say sort of Mesoamerican the gothic uh, set on this? So there's two sets in the Rampage. Um, Rampart. Uh, Rampart, sorry. There's two sets in the Rampart uh, Kickstarter. So there's uh, that kind of Aztec-y one and the Gothic one. Can I say the Gothic one looks pure genius. Mm. Yeah. There are some of the, yeah, I will admit, large pledge. They're out of my price range, but holy smokes. Just what you can build with them is absolutely incredible. Yeah. You will get some really cool table layouts from this, and they've just added stairs to it which previously Ooh. they've been holding back on this mm. hopefully yeah. we should have an image coming up uh yeah they're just adding stairs to the whole thing which should definitely make playing over it all a lot easier yeah mm. scroll down to some of the big pledges there justin because um, I, I want to there's ones where you get right oh. down where it looks like it's it's what I've always had in mind. Keep going, man. Oh, Keep bigger going. Than these? Oh, you, well, up, 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 up. There? there. Look at that one. Whoa. Right. That's so a that's Korean. that's the gothic one, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. So, so let me bring that up. Right. So uh, so there's the guts of two thousand parts there. But yeah. but um, Archon John will not mind building that. <laughs> And it'll be painted so, really well. Somewhere John just broke a brush in half and it's, he does not know why. <laughs> it's what I've always imagined that, you know, mm. in the, like take 40K, right? So yeah. um, we're trying to get a bit of um, um, 40K. Justin, I'll be talking more about it in hobby time in the future, but Justin has convinced me to, to start a project of the Adeptus Custodis. All right, mm. let me put it this way. Everybody out there, you know the way whenever you watch us play stuff and you go, God damn it, they made me buy stuff. I've now done that to Warren. What a <laughs> Yes. So I, I, I'd been, I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd been having a look. I said, look, I want to do, I want to do something, uh, mm. something different. Um, and Justin said, oh, forget that. 
you know, because I've been talking with Thomas Menes, yeah. and myself and Thomas Menes have been bashing amazing ideas, mm. like doing a um, a Tau Force mm -hmm. in the style of Samurai. Oh, um, with, yeah. With all of the pennants and the yeah, backs that, and that stuff. That would be great for just like a variant of Commander Farsight. Oh, so. mm -hmm. you know, I, I think a Tau, a Tau Samurai uh, thing would be amazing. But Justin says, no, forget all of that. I have the, I have the perfect army for you. I said, well, what's that? And he said, they are perfect for you. They're all really big. Yeah. They're all really flash. Yeah. And they're basically the arseholes of the Imperium. <laughs> that, I thought that was the Imperium as a whole. Literally and, as a whole. Uh, as a whole. And I thought, okay then, you're, you must be, you must be talking. He said, I yes. Have your attention. It's the Adeptus Custodes. <laughs> he says they're big, flashy, and gold. They're brute force. There's yeah. nothing, there, 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 there's, no, there's no subtlety to them whatsoever. They're perfect for you. I and you know what? Here's the way I put it. I think he's right. Low model count. <laughs> Low model count. Easy to paint. John will thank you for that. <laughs> and on the tabletop, they are hard as nails. I'm looking forward to finding out how hard as nails uh, they are. And it's the first... So we've done a few 40k projects yeah. in here. We did yeah. uh, well one of my favorites. If you haven't seen it, check out backstage where we did a Napoleonic themed Imperial Guard yep. force. I use we because <laughs> I am involved. I, I come up with ideas, <laughs> but uh, this is the first. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to actually have a go at most of this myself. Yeah. Okay. So it's the first uh, first um, army I've done in in quite some time actually. Yep. And and I've, I've I I thought I I decided to do something which I haven't done in a long time. Uh -huh. So, with the Adeptus Custodes, okay, you um, you, the army's not very big. Not really. And there's not an awful lot of choices in there either. Okay? No, not a, you're not going to get lost in your okay. options. But I can get a land raider. Yeah, yeah. Which is one of the big and gold finest models yep. of all time. I love the land raider. And do you okay? want to know the best thing in their rules? The land raider is even better. Because it's a venerable land raider. Yeah, exactly. So I thought to myself, how do I make a venerable land raider look venerable? like a venerable Are land raider? Are you just going to stick like a, a, one of those walking frames for old people? At the no! <laughs> <laughs> that, that, instead of a dozer blade, it's got one of those. Well, what I've done is something that I've wanted to do for... Zimmer frame, that was the word. Ten years. Uh -huh. About yeah. ten years. Um, there's a company out there who I've been a huge fan of for a mm -hmm. long, long time. They're called uh, Skibor Miniatures. Oh, yes, Cybor, yeah. or Cybor. Cybor, Skibor, Cybor. Okay. Um, if you go and if you go and look them up, yeah, right? Yeah, I'm on. So I'm on the case. I uh, I don't often get the opportunity to place uh, to place an order. Yeah. And don't tell Andrea. Okay. <laughs> Do not tell Andrea. Andrea is not to watch this show. So, um, but I placed I placed an order. Okay, yeah. because um, they do they do a thing for land raiders. Okay, that um, has always been uh, uh, something that I've wanted to, to get a, to get. So scroll to the very yeah. bottom of the, the the navigation because it's Se that old. It's at the bottom, right? Stop. Seaboard does brilliant decorated stuff. plates. Okay, mm -hmm. so go into decorated plates. No, wait. Now we're going to scroll down a bit slowly. Keep mm -hmm. going. I'll tell you when to stop. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. No, stop. <laughs> Lion Big Conversion Kit. This? No, no, Top, up. Up, up on There you go. Yep. Yeah. And then open it up and then bring it across. Yeah, I, this is something they've always done that their image is open in a okay, separate it, window. He wants me to translate. I will let Google translate. There. Can we? Uh, can you yeah, extend yeah, that I'm, out? I'm yeah. On, I'm on, I'm on. There so you go. this is what I have picked up for the Land Raider. To actually make it look that venerable, nice. That will look really cool. The lion's cool. heads work really well for custodes. Well, uh, this is what I thought. You know, I, I thought to myself, you know, if you if you're going to do uh, the, these guys are the bodyguard of the yeah. emperor. Yeah. So what I had thought was, what if he had a small group of these guys that were the emperor's lions? You know, so it's mm. uh, like the main guys. Oh, <laughs> that joke. Oh, I just yeah. <laughs> Oh god! I like it. <laughs> so, it's, so these are like the some, some might say the pride of the Imperium. The pride hey! of the Imperium. Oh, and we're man. not lying. <laughs> <laughs> if I was wearing a hat, I would take it off to the pair of you. So it's um, it, so I've I've picked 
I've picked that up. Yeah, yeah. And it's the it, so I'm just uh, I'm I'm excited about it. Uh, I'm really cannot wait to see what John can do with it. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing: uh, you can you still have the opportunity to do your. Uh, samurai tau if you want to for like kill team because yeah. of course you can't feel the adeptus custodes in kill team yes john That's told me this yes this this was the, the only drawback of it i wanted to, to have a crack at the kill team um in the the visitor center here we're getting a, a kill team uh, yeah. thing going and i wanted to have a crack at it and john said no you can't use them and i said well why not and he said because if they let them in you would only be able to use one guy pretty That's much how hard they are um so um i'm going to can you use inquisitors uh, in kill team i don't think i've seen them i in don't kill team. maybe I, they're added in the, that commander's book yeah possibly. we'll, we'll I'll have find a look. out I'll have yeah. a look. um i'm not swatted up on, uh, enough on it to know but uh, yeah adeptus adeptus custodes mm -hmm. has got in there so back to the point that i was about to make <laughs> yeah. right so I have uh, uh, always imagined if we go back to the rampart yeah. no 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 back oh, to rampart. back to the rampart oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll always get us back on topic again. Go okay. back down to that that table. Okay. I have Give always imagined that um, if you were going to see a cathedral, yeah, in the forty first millennium, I think right, it would almost be it, continent. Size. It would be, yeah, it would. So at the very least, I think a cathedral should be the size of a six by four table. Yeah, that just playing through a cathedral. Complex oh, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Be incredible, yeah. No, the key, of course, would be to sorry, I'm a Harlequin player, so I ignore any terrain that's on the table anyway. It's just like, oh, look at this wonderful train jump. Well, the key would be laying it out on a table right. so that it has structure, so that yeah. when you're looking at it. It do, it doesn't just look like a mess of ruins. It still looks like what 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 remains um, of a cathedral. Well, there's an idea I've had for a, a table floating in my head for a couple of weeks now, Warren. Since we we got the visitor center pretty much up and running, yeah, I want to do a section of a hive as a gaming table and this stuff. You mean like a beehive? No, no, no a imperial hive. An hive imperial. city. Oh, a hive city. Yeah. Oh, okay. So a section of it. So what I want to like, do is I want to yeah. take Necromunda the, style of thing. Yeah, kind of, but. I want to take it and make it a 6 by 4 table, but what I want to do is I want to take the layers of foam that we normally use for rock yeah. and have that just as like big holding blocks for big sections of flat uh, pieces, maybe using some of this to actually do an imperial cathedral at one side of it, but another side where it's maybe crumbled and broken away to the outside, and then you've got more of a, a rackage sort of level to it. Well, let's talk about hives levels. for a minute, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're totally, uh, he he says as he away, starts yeah. scratching yeah. himself. We're going to talk about hives. It's yeah. bees. Which one of us is, is the bee phobia? Or it's you, Ben. Or Sam, yeah. I'm apophobic, yeah. <laughs> so uh, hives... You know, this is the Necromunda kind of stuff. This is basically yeah. when you're in Imperial City, they, they go like a mile deep, don't they? They, they keep going down and no, down. No, they go down. way up. And down. They go up to the stratosphere. Yes. And down. Yeah. But the if you read the first book from Necromunda, from that core set, it gives you a real idea of life in a hive. Yeah. But it's just imagine this grinding machine of a city where you are just a human cog. And mm -hmm. I think I could lay out something on the table. But is it is it really what cool. is what is the style? You know, it's um and like it's I've always been inspired. Quite industrial, very gothic. It, it, so the gothism. Oh, the, yeah, the goth it's imperial. Yeah, it's yeah. Imperial. So it goes all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It just looks of, less grand. Yeah, because I've been I, I've always been inspired by um the the trailer that was put out for I think it was it Lord Inquisitor. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you had the imperial fists, yeah, marching through, stuff through. Uh, around. So I've always, I've always uh, had that as an inspiration of of what the upper levels of an imperial city, yeah. look like. And I wondered, was it the similar style that goes down into the deeper it, levels? I so. think the style would become if you've ever walked around the back of a theater. So if you ha you go to a, a grand theater and there's the very nice facade around the front and if you walk around the back there's suddenly the just the alleyway with pipes sticking out everywhere oh so yeah. we still have the same kind of facade but but, but we layered with pipes and yeah and the like, like so this so this yeah. is a couple of screenshots from the necromunda video game that they're going to be doing yeah so there's lots of industrial gear this is a perfect one to show it yeah but you still have all the the gothic features on the walls and things mm -hmm. and i would love to do a gaming table like that as a section of a hive city yeah, and I think it could look absolutely amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. that could be that could be a lot of fun. You could totally kill team in that. Too. Oh, definitely, well, kill team. Anna would make it big enough that you could just forty k away. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, um, so anyway, to be in with a chance of winning um, one of three Rampart pledges, what do they need to do, Sam? Just comment down below on either here on the YouTube video or come over to ontabletop.com and leave a comment on this post. Yep, and don't forget to subscribe, like, and ding the dong. Gotta ding the dong. Okay, um, uh, finally, uh, in updates this week, John did uh, three live uh, streams in painting the Vril Panzer from the mighty Reich Busters. Um, you you got to go and check this out. This model is absolutely fantastic, and John has done a wonderful job uh, bringing it into a kind of a, a traditional German armor pattern. It, yeah. it really is it uh, is ultra, ultra cool. Gorgeous. He, he rose to the challenge on this one, I think. Yeah. I, I know he tried out some new techniques a bit as well, just some yeah. new levels of mix. For yeah, him. it's definitely worth a catch up. If, you, if you've if you got some painting and stuff to do at home um, and you fancy some company from John, go and stick it on. Um, each one's a couple of hours long and John will patter away with you there and, and tell you about the techniques and, mm. and whatever he's yeah. doing. And of course, it's a beautiful model. The game itself is... Uh, by by everything you've told me, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to play it. It's a really good game, I, yeah. and you should check out our Let's Play. I loved it. Um, it's a game that I would love to see the mechanics uh, reskinned mm -hmm. um, to both fantasy to yep. science fiction. I think it's I think it's a game format that I would love to see um, Mythic take forward. It's something similar to the way Simon did with the Zombie Side, mm -hmm. um, and I would love to see them apply. That that game format um, to lots and lots of different genres because um, it, it just has so much potential and the, the the whole dynamic of creeping around yeah and then then it going into the shit hits the fan uh, mode where you know everything what they could reskin suddenly... it with, Warren. what you know what they could reskin it with what 28, 28 days later yeah. Yeah, that that it's... raid zombie sort of movie if you remember it mm -hmm. that could be so the, fun with the that reason format. the reason that I. I would love to see it done uh, in in a fantasy because I think yeah. it would make a perfect dungeon crawl. That, that is the one I I would love to see as well and because it, if that noise happens and suddenly everything yeah. comes spilling I, out. I of would the like dungeon. to see it done even yeah. a bit like Thief, uh, if you mm -hmm. remember those old computer games. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah. you're sneaking around trying to steal things, you make a noise and suddenly all the guards are on you, and you find out the uh, dodgy goings on of these higher up echelons of society that you're stealing yeah. from and you find maybe they have have magical experiments going on mm -hmm. so, I, I, again just, I, just... I, I i think it would be it, it the game itself uh, of right busters the engine itself yeah there's some tweaking and tuning to do but the engine itself has so much promise mm -hmm. and there's so much scope for um, for discovery and engagement and and even uh, there's enough role playing between characters and everything feels so heroic in it. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's an absolutely incredible underlying game engine and uh, and uh, the reason that I'm so holding out hope that they would take that and and turn it into a fantasy dungeon adventure kind mm -hmm. of thing is because can you imagine the fantasy miniatures that would come out? Yes, of, of course. Can you imagine they them and would, then seeing them painted by Seb? Oh, my God. They would be gorgeous, unbelievable. Like, yeah. I mean, uh, out of this world yeah. uh, mm -hmm. levels of, uh, of amazingness. Now, obviously, they'll, they, they, the creative minds in there will be able to take it and apply so much layers of creative uh, yeah. creativity to it. But to, to see, I really desperately hope that uh, that they see the potential of that as a game engine, yeah, and and take that uh, take that across because the uh, unlike other games, because so much of the the so much of the feel and the vibe is controlled by what's written on the cards, mm -hmm. it leaves itself so open to be tuned and mm -hmm. um, expanded upon to match the genre that they would apply it to. Yeah. And it means that you'd be able to pick up a game like that. Yeah. And uh, you know, if you've played Reichbusters, then you'll have a fair idea of how to play this. And it would allow you to play different genres. Um, so why and you want Dungeon just, Busters? Oh, you know, it's, <laughs> I, I, can I like just, that name, actually. Uh, you know, that a Dungeon Busters uh, would be would be incredible you know it would be i was just incredible. thinking about how cool this would be if it was themed as uh, sort of like robin hood 
and oh, going up against yeah. the king and his merry men and all that kind of thing. Like, yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah. the sheriff and the and all yeah. that guy and stuff. Yeah. That'd be pretty awesome. So. Somewhere right now, as and Ben are both going, can I get these down? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it, it's it it just has so much potential. That that engine yeah. is is so much fun, yeah. so much fun, and the, the the that that key moment of the change in dynamic mm, of mm. the game, it, it's. It's it's excellent. It mm. is absolutely excellent. And the the, the thing is, uh, you know, it, it could get tiresome if it was the only thing that was in the game. Mm. But there's so much scope yeah. for exploration and, yeah. and whatnot. Uh, it's it's a, it's brilliant. A mm. lovely, lovely piece of work uh, by the guys uh, at Mythic. And uh, if you're interested in the models, go and check out that Vril Panzer. Well, uh, you can check out the Vril Panzer, but I believe the Kickstarter is now over. So if you are wanting to get in on it, if you've been on the fence for too long and missed it. Wait for a pledge manager now. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll keep you po- keep you guys yeah, posted yeah. about the the pledge managers and stuff. But uh, it, it's well worth having a look at. It really yeah. is. Okay, Ben, big news this week. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, it, 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 the 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 title of this video, um, rest in peace, Space Marines. <laughs> Oof, this this it's, one makes yeah. me nervous. Yeah, it, it's um, I, I maybe maybe. Skipping ahead here, Ben. Will we? Can we? Can we? Do you want to tackle the big topic first, or do you want to get the? Do you want to get the well, campaign out of the way first? I'll give you some grounding as to where a lot of this sort of uh, this discussion point came from. Um, so uh, last weekend there was a big thing about sort of one forty thousand and where things were going to be going in the next couple of months and stuff. Yeah. And a large focus of this is towards a new campaign book for Vigilus. Yeah. So Vigilus is the world that sits between uh, two sides of the Imperium at this point, and it's kind of like the melting pot for all the different races and all the Xenos and the Imperium forces to be battling it out for control of it because it's such a key integral point of this. And so uh, Games Workshop are going to be sort of ticking on their story a little bit further, taking things a little bit uh, another step beyond with this new campaign book, which will introduce a new storyline and sort of campaigns and scenarios for you to follow, as well as a new villain uh, called Harken Ward World Claimer, who is proclaimed to the galaxy and to the Imperium as a whole that he will be able to destroy Vigilus and take it for Abaddon within 80 days. So this is a big thing that's coming out of this. Um, obviously, one of the interesting things that came out is that obviously to go up against Harkon, we're going to have to have a good guy. And so on the side of the Imperium, we've now got Marnius Kalgar returning to the fold in new Primaris guise. So he still has the gauntlets of Ultramar, and he's but he's not the head honcho of the Space Marines anymore because obviously uh, yeah, Robo Girly Man, Girly Man now, came back. Yeah, is now in charge. Sam, so can, uh, uh, ben, man. you're going to have to sit back a bit, uh, a bit, mate, because we can't see the entirety of your beautiful face. Yeah, you're, you're, tripping, so... <laughs> you're yourself a little bit off the top there, buddy. Um, uh, but yes, so yeah, so this this spurred off a little bit of an interesting discussion about what's going to be happening in terms of Primaris and where it's going to go in the future. Um, so, for example, when it comes to uh, some of the stu- some of the sort of larger um, sort of army kits that are coming out over the next couple of months in the run up to Christmas, two of them are very very Primaris focused. They don't yes. have any of the old models in them. Correct. And in the Imperial Fist one, you actually have some accessories which allow you to add a lot more sort of uh, 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 items onto your Primaris Marines, for example, Power Fist and stuff. Yes, which they didn't have previously. Mm. Yeah, Yeah. and so this is having a lot of people discussing the idea that potentially what might happen in the future is that we might start to see a phase out of the old Space Marines in favor of us seeing largely more Primaris-centric forces on the Mm. tabletop. Yes. So, as I say, it is an upgrade kit at the moment, just in one of these battle forces, but that Mm. doesn't, and that doesn't necessarily mean that Space Marines are going to go the way of the Dodo. So don't worry about that. But yeah, they will. It certainly, it certainly raises an interesting discussion point. Okay, mm. right. Yeah. Let, let me let me let me let me bring let me bring some opinion to this. Okay. okay. So uh, two years ago, whenever the Primaris um, actually first came out, I has had it been a, two years? Um, yep. Yep. It, it's, 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 about that. Yeah. It's nearly three. It'll be you know by um, by. I think they came by out by June. It's yeah. about two and a half years ago. By June. By yeah, they June, came out while I was in Japan. <laughs> Drink a shot. <laughs> Wait, no, you were in Japan. I never knew. <laughs> okay, have you drunk your shots? Okay, <laughs> so um, Japan, uh, Japan, Japan, uh, Japan, Japan, <laughs> Japan, 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 Japan. So you'll give people alcohol. Walk back home back. later. I had an opportunity to to, to uh, get a chinwag with Jez Goodwin. Yeah. Um, at the time and um. Uh, Jez, obviously the legendary designer behind the original Space Marines, yeah. and um, 
I was uh, uh, firstly, I was I was uh, complimenting them on the job they had done with the Primaris yeah. because it, uh, I think the Primaris are a stupendous design yeah. of, of a space marine. I think that they look absolutely wonderful. Well, when you and modernize it, something so iconic, well, this is the thing. You know, I'd always looked at the space marines and I thought to myself, how can you better that? Yeah. And he totally did. Yep. I much prefer. And I know that Jez, um, uh, there was a couple of things um, that uh, we were all talking about at the uh, at the time in a, in, in a group, and uh, Jez had mentioned, you know, that a how intimidating it, it had been for him yeah. to tackle such an iconic mm. design and to uh, and to take it to the next level. And um, you know, I kind of I kind of got the 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 impression from that that this this wasn't just about a, a new unit mm. this was there, was there was much more pressure um on jez to deliver something outstanding here um so you know it, although he never said it reading between the lines um from uh from the the, the importance of that that, that guy you know he, he seemed to and how seriously he took that that role, mm -hmm. and back then I I, I assumed yes, you, this is clearly the new Space Marine. And yeah. We'll be looking. We'll be looking at a phased approach, but Space Marines are going to look like this in the future. When it came out, I was surprised that they actually worked them into the law as Primaris. Yeah. I assumed that they would go. This is the new Space Marine kids. Yeah, like they did These with the Terminators. Space, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. These are Space Marines, and. Yeah, you could use your old miniatures, sure. But as you bought in new ones, these are the Space Marines. I, well, I'm very surprised they worked it into the law. To be fair, um, I actually give them a lot of credit for that. Mm. Because um, by this stage, right, we're now 30 years into Warhammer 40k. Mm. I would like to hazard a guess that there's probably a billion space marines out there mm. there's, I, I there's about a hundred in a box under my bed yeah i wouldn't be surprised if games workshop have actually stamped a billion space marines mm. um so uh there was another thing that came up and when we were when i was chatting with the, with jez and the, the the other designers in in games workshop at the time and it was it was something that in passing that seemed very important to them, mm -hmm. but hadn't really been talked about at the start. Yeah. And that was about that there was a process in the background where a space marine could go through a process to be uh, to be put into Primaris armor. Yeah. yeah now yeah. it wasn't being talked about at that point of uh, of Primaris very much, mm -hmm. but the once again reading between the lines, it seemed like a very important thing. For the designers and the yeah. design mm -hmm. team uh, about this, which once again suggested to me that, th that this is what it obviously is, and it was you know it's time to to take the Space Marine and uh, and bring it bang up to date and and make it in even more incredible than than it than it yeah. already was. Now a lot of people, I, I was reading the comments on this post, and they uh, some people were very worried that this means they're uh original space marine armies are going to be unusable now because no. they're that the primaris focus on single weapon squads where whereas the tactical marines were all about variety yeah i think you're just going to be able to upgrade your primaris into primaris tacticals or yeah so I, it's use them. It, look, no, there, there's the there, primaris play very differently mm. and it's, at the it's, moment well at, at the moment and they'll 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 probably come up with a new unit. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 yeah. You know, look, well, we are we are going through we're going through a phase <coughs> that we have went through in a small way before, mm -hmm. and that was when the the Terminators um, yeah. upgraded mm -hmm. um, to the because Terminators at the time they looked great, and then they made Terminators that were incredible. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you know, we've just went through the Space Hulk challenge, and it, it is because I still think Terminators are king. Yeah, but just wait, because they're probably going to have to redesign the Terminator. The Terminator will get a redesign, and I wouldn't be surprised if it happened this year. Mm. If I hope we, so. If we started to see yeah, yeah. Um, the, 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 the next uh, edition of, yeah. the, of the Terminator. Yeah. To be Mars, fair to Games Workshop, yeah. the, the, the design team there... I think have been very very respectful on this, yeah. so they 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 recognize the sheer number of uh, space marine models and stuff that's out there. Mm -hmm. So they thought, well, look, 
let's try and see if we can create a way to integrate these into the armies so that they don't just look weird. Because um, uh, I think what they were trying to avoid was a, a, a case of uh, people feeling like their space marines had been replaced and stuff. They wanted to try and give a seamless, slow grow way mm -hmm. of introducing the new style armor um, uh, into your forces. Yeah. And and to be fair, whether you thought the the whether you thought the the execution of that was clumsy or not, there was no easy way to do it. And and I commend them for 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 giving it a shot. I I was perfectly fine with it. Mm -hmm. And and I'm I think what we, what we will see. Is that we will we will just see a thing where they are basically all space marines again? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that'll uh, be how it goes. I think what you're gonna see first is not that they're all just instantly gonna go Primaris. I think you're gonna see all of your characters are gonna get upgraded to Primaris first. Possibly. And until yeah. all of that's done, I don't think you'll see the regular squads getting upgraded. Yeah, I, I well, just for the the way it will happen, I'm thinking. Well, even in, in even in that box of the the Imperial fists. Yeah. You know, you're starting to see the, the yeah, ability to the change it, the, the Primaris. You know, it's don't, don't I, worry. There's an, there's enough Primaris lieutenants out there to field. I don't know how many different. Armies. Yeah, <laughs> it's it, it it's really a case of. Um, I don't know how it will go, mm. but I wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. What I would like to see, which I think would be really interesting, is as a bit of a nod. Uh, now that they have actually built the armor into the lore, mm. okay. Um, I would love to see them do a, a little bit of a nod in the next editions going forward, where the the older Space Marine the the, the armor um, actually get a little bit of a venerable tag yeah. to them, you know, um, uh, to give them uh, you know even some special rules or something like well, that to 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 was, show that yeah there was a, there was a rule for status there was a rule for Chaos Space Marines I'm still I'm, it may still exist I can't remember but where they could have what was called like it was like a, a long war veteran um, of the long war mm, veteran mm -hmm. of the long war why not have that similarly applied to sort of old style yeah, space marines that you want to put into sort of more more squads and stuff so. yeah. I, I think I'd have, I think it it would be a lovely kind of sign of respect mm. to the older models and I would love to see that same thing applied to um, other models that get replaced, yeah. and, like the older Dreadnoughts. Well, I have uh, a question. I, Do I you love the more modern Dreadnoughts. Them? Sorry? The Space Marine model is still a great model. I don't yeah, think amazing. you need to get rid of it. Well, look, they're not getting rid of it because um, uh, not, uh, yet, not, yeah. not not yet. Anyway, I mean the older mark, you know. Uh, but because look at the 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 blind buy, the Space Marine heroes and stuff like that. Oh, there, yeah. there, none of those are Primaris. Oh yeah, but what I'm saying is the actual tactical Marine box. I don't think that ever needs got rid of. Mm -hmm. I think it will always sell just as well. I don't well, think that the Primaris will take over from It'll it. sell based on what the rules of the game yeah. allow it to do. And then, uh, I understand yeah. what you're saying. It's very collectible in its own right. Yeah. But ultimately, it will live or die mm. based on, on the rules. Yeah. And I, I think... As, as, soon, as soon as there's a way for them to work into the background or to create a kit that will allow a Primaris Space Marine to carry a missile launcher and a flamer, yeah. At that yeah. point, they'll just get rid of the old tactical squad and they'll make sure that the Primaris one is the new one. Yeah, I think so, yeah. we are on and, the way uh, towards and, Primaris and I, tactical squads. And I think it's fair enough because you know, I think Primaris Space Marine armies are going to be amazing. However, they'll look amazing. No, yeah. they will. No. Um, however, the rumbles now are on Primaris uh, scaled uh, rhinos mm. and, and other vehicles. Well, I am hearing rumblings that we're going to get a new codex in 2019. For yeah. Space Marines, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't be surprised. I'm really looking forward to seeing the chapter approved for this year to see what rules are going to be in there. Yeah. Well, of course, it's not just the uh, the new Primaris and everything that is showing a new direction for 40k. There is an element of expanding the storylines in this mm -hmm. new campaign book as well. It, uh, ben, you were talking to me about this earlier as well. Yeah. So one of the interesting things about this is that, like, one of the big things that's always been a problem for 40k in general was this idea that everything was always at this two minutes to midnight and nothing could ever progress yeah and so with what they're doing with vigilus it allows them to create almost a sort of like compartmentalized version of the 40k universe yeah. on that one planet and it allows them to do catastrophic things great brilliant things and all these kind of things that were you know would be fantastic for people to see in the wider world of 40k but on a small scale so they can do things like great crusades and hack on um, potentially destroying this planet all that kind of thing without it affecting the wider lore as well and it also means that they can come up with a whole bunch of different reasons to throw all the different factions onto this planet because one of the big things that for a lot of people you know always hits 
home is like well why are my tau fighting kind of thing we yeah. we live on the other side of the galaxy why are we getting involved mm -hmm. if you make everything centralized around this one idea of this one key planet suddenly you've got a big uh, you know a big sort of focus for a lot of the different armies and stuff to, and, yeah. and it helps people sort of generate a bit more of a narrative around their force as well so it's it's kind of like the the, the benefits and the drawbacks that uh, i want to do a comparison yeah yeah so you take 40k versus um, uh, the, the two big historical games, so like Flames of War, Bolt Action. Yeah. Okay. So um, Bolt Action, Flames of War. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the first edition of their models are in metal or in resin. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, those guys come out with uh, better plastic models. Yeah. But because they're based on historical tanks and things like that there, um, it's very easy to just slip them in. It's just a better looking tank. Yeah. Okay. Games Workshop in 40K want to replace the Space Marine with a better looking model. <coughs> That's not quite so easy. You know, because it's um it's you could do what they did with the Terminators and just come out with a better model and hope for the best. But when you have a billion Space Marine yeah. models out there, it's not such an easy thing. That's the con that they face. The pro that they face is obviously uh, in the World War II genre. Um, there are some limitations uh, to where yeah, you can. You, you where can't you can start throwing yeah. out experimental vehicles. Take, and stuff. take the story. You can, but it, it, it's. Um, it suddenly becomes weird. It's, it becomes a bit fringe, okay? In 40K. Mm. You you suddenly have this ability to um, to start taking it where you wherever you want. Yeah, I personally, when you we talk about this two minutes to midnight thing, it always seems like it's a big limiting uh, limiting constraint on the forty k universe, but it's not really because those two minutes you can uh, you can make them as long as you want or as short as you want. And the other thing is that someday they can just move yeah. the, the, the well move they did. The, the they, two that's, that's what uh, they did. With no, no, the... I mean they can just move that it's no longer oh. two minutes to midnight. It's, it's an hour and a half to midnight. You know that they, they just move midnight. Yeah, but because midnight they have has happened. Yeah. Well, no, well, no, it hasn't. No, it hasn't it, happened. It, it's more yeah. like we've moved from two minutes to midnight to a minute to midnight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's and that something happened. Basically, the, that. Midnight stroke yeah. is the death of the Imperium. This is this is uh, this is basically anybody that uh, of any importance within the Games Workshop over the past thirty odd years. Hmm. They yeah. they all know that ultimately they know how the story ends. The story ends with the death of the it, Imperium. It's like what happened sure with that? they yeah, don't survive this. It's well, what, are you sure? Because yeah. some of the backstory these days is a bit more positive. It, yeah, it's but, like what happened with Warhammer Fantasy Battles. It was also on that two minutes to midnight. Yeah, and it then they had the midnight event that happened, mm -hmm. the end times, and that. That literally was the midnight moment. The entirety of the world was overrun by chaos. And this 40K has think... always existed in that same sort of space. Yeah, Justin... This is why I think 40K have had that midnight moment whenever the Eye no, of no, Terror no. ripped across the galaxy. No, 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 Justin. But it has went the other way because now you have Robert A. Gulliman fighting all back. No, no, no. It, I disagree. It, it, I, I'm, I'm telling you now, the most senior folk in Games Workshop that, that you and I would ever be able to get to talk to. Right. Um, have told me this. Okay. Okay. That's not how the story ends. They all die. <laughs> it's no. They all go to a farm upstate. It's the Imperium. Right. Here's a question. Dies. Here's a question. Okay. So we've seen the Space Marines get a gorgeous redesign. Yes. Which model from the entire range would you love them to see that done to next? The Rhino. The Rhino. Yes, I so want. You're to... staying with Space Marine and wanting to see the Rhino. Oh, Orcs as a whole. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well. Oh. Well. Uh, right. Well. Here's the. Yeah. Look. They have loads of options. Yeah. So here's the ones that um, I want to see the rest of the Space Marine line fleshed out to to suit the Primaris. Right. If we're going down that route, let's let's bring All the right. drop pods, the Prima, uh, the Rhinos and stuff yeah. up to. Well, up to just stuff. for the sake okay. of it, I'm going to disagree with the fact that they're going to get rid of the Tactical Marine because I think it's good enough to still stay and play with. The primaris, okay. 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 Do you know at some point during this, I was looking at him and there's just this wee sense of worry over yeah. his face, and all I could hear was "Hello, darkness, my <laughs> friend." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, don't, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to frighten ah. you, man. You know, it's, these are good times we're headed yeah. into. You know, oh, even, yeah, even though that. they all die, right. it's like. But 
after the Space Marines, yeah. right, let's have a think about this. Let's talk about like a major refresh. Yeah. Okay? There was one I was talking to someone about in the Pro Store, which was the Orcs. And uh, I've actually seen the first miniatures where they've done a redesign on the Orcs, mm -hmm. which is the new uh, wagons they've done. So the stuff for Speed Freaks. Yes. Looking at the Orcs on that, they look totally different to your line Orcs. I think uh, of all of them, the orcs are kind of the only ones that I think need a complete. Maybe refresh. chaos space marines. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chaos, chaos space marines. Be good. Yeah. yeah, outside chaos of the space plague marines. marines. Yeah. yeah. So and of course we we got the new um, noise marine. Yeah. 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 This the, guy. Yeah, I know which you've is, been. But which is based on Jess Goodwin's original sketches. To get yeah. Back to Jess Goodwin. Yep. Yeah. I yeah. know you've been dying to bring that one up, Justin. <laughs> it's um uh, the uh, that is just a. Stunning, stunning. I love it. Yeah. I absolutely love it. Do you know what I love about that? I love the base. Yes. They, to the base, they yeah. totally went for the classic base. Yeah. Um, whoever painted that in the. That in the doesn't look bit, like a base. Looks whoever, more like an electric guitar. Oh, God. <laughs> it's um, whoever went for that in the, yeah. in the, in the heavy metal team. Um, well done. Kudos to that. Doing the classic green base mm. on yeah. that was, was a lovely touch. Yeah. It, it, for me, Eldar are fine. Uh, okay, you can um, maybe tidy them up. And do I think they're guardians. Could yeah, use but I don't nothing. think they need to change in scale. No, no, okay? not in scale. Uh, Necrons don't need to change in scale. No, Tau don't need to change in scale. Um, yeah, Chaos could do with a change in scale just to, yeah. to, to yeah. keep the fearsome. Like, we we fearsome saw those two, n those uh, three new uh, Chaos Marines in mm -hmm. the Blackstone Fortress. Well, I, I think yeah. that's the direction they're going to take. I don't well, think anything in the, I don't. Yeah, I don't think anything in the Imperial Guard needs to change in scale. No. Um, the only army I think it needs to scale up a little bit in terms of their bulk and their size and mm. their their format and their yeah. is the Orcs. Mm. See, I don't know because I also think in the Guard you could do with some modernization of the miniatures. I I still don't really. Like the Ogrins, I would love to see them get yeah, a but redesign. But, but these are these are just tweaks. No, I, I, I'm talking about going ground up, redesign that bad boy. Okay, redesigning the Ogrins, I'm considering a tweak. It's not like redesigning the Space Marine. Okay, yeah, there, there's more like redesigning the Cadian guy. And it, yeah. it doesn't just have to be scale because some of the models are showing an older design aesthetic, like the Orcs. You're seeing the older design aesthetic with the the faces, the hands, things like that. Going back my point, my those, point so. on orcs, though, Justin, mm. right, is I bring out my fancy new Primaris army. Yeah, and the orcs look okay. a little weedy next. The to them. orcs look really weedy and squatty. Mm. You know? um, uh, so, and that's not what an orc in the forty k no. universe should look like. No. So they need a scale uh, for all of the others. I don't think it makes any difference. Guard, they, they, st their scale is fine. I don't think they need a rank and file overview no. and redesign. I don't know. It could I don't, be nice though. I don't think. Of course, it'd be nice, but you know, like, it's what are you going to do? You're going to add three mil to them? What no, difference no, would that I'm make? I'm not talking about scale. You're too focused on scale. I am talking about but, making the design current the, and making it look like it matches up okay. well with what, the new What is the difference? What is the difference between the 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 old Space Marine and the Primaris Marine, Justin? The armor has been redesigned completely from the ground up. Yes, it's bigger. But bigger doesn't essentially mean better. If they had kept them the same size... That's not just, what now, people like, have been telling me over the years. Yeah, but <laughs> for me, if they had made that Primaris Marine the exact same Take a shot. as a Space Marine, it would oh. be fine to me. It doesn't have to be bigger. But they I'm didn't. I'm saying they can modernize... Yeah, but you're too focused on it. I'm saying they can modernize the design <laughs> without having to change scale. And I, I bet you people will agree with me out there. If you took a regular guardsman, completely redesigned his kit okay. for the entire base squad, people would okay. love it. Yeah, but... I'm going to grant you one of two things is going to happen out there. Either people are going to completely agree with you on this. Or call me an in, idiot. In which case I have completely missed the point of this conversation. Or they might be sitting there like me right now going, have I completely missed <laughs> the point of this conversation? <laughs> Because it, it is, yeah. it, you know, it's the you're point, focusing in on a single. Well, design the aspect. point was the the things that needed a scale of, uh, overhaul to bring it in line with the Primaris. The Primaris yeah. are now the, are now going to be the new benchmark upon which everything is going to be uh, compared to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if the Primaris replaced the Tactical Marine, which yeah. is going to happen at some point. Okay. I don't think it will, but okay. Uh, hello, darkness. <laughs> it's, it is going to happen. Um, uh, and if they do that, then everything then be it comes compared to the Primaris. Yeah. So from that perspective, I'm saying 
I think most of the range is fine in terms of the, their sizing, their scaling and stuff, mm. except for orcs. I think orcs really do need um, a, a new fresh look and a mm. new fresh rescale okay. for them to still look formidable. Mm. Okay, and what I'm trying to get across is... Okay, is, I know what no, you're no, no, trying wait, to get across. Wait, yes, okay. Which is what I think we're crossing connections on here is, I think there are other models and other races within the range that they could be redesigning to make them look a lot better, because some of them are really showing their age now. Yes, but they're doing that as a matter of course. I'm not disputing that. They do that anyway. They, they, they do that right across the range. They go back in and they, 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 make, they make tweaks. They make it better. They, they do whatever. Yeah, but I, I, I don't see some of that as tweaks. I see it as if they go in and completely redesign something, that is as major a change as changing the Space Marine without doing scale. Okay, so hang on a second, <laughs> right? So going in and changing the design of Ogrens. Yes, let's you, you completely redesign right, those. All right, you consider that as major as as uh, as what they, they they did in bringing out the primaris i think yes if they do it to say a baseline unit like say a guardsman squad they go in completely redesign the miniature the kit the weapon no, hang on everything. a second I, you, you know, don't you... focus in you're focusing in on stuff to try and make your point <laughs> if they go in and did the same to the Thai fire warrior unit designed it from the ground up again right. i'd say you could have as major a shift as you saw with the primaris but is that the same with ogrens Stop focusing on one word. But, but you mentioned Ogrens. I mentioned Ogrens um, because um, I hate uh, the current design. Yeah, so I'm asking you for a, for a yes or no yes, on this. Yes, fine, yes. Okay, so if they if they redesign the Ogren from the ground up... Yes, or any squad. You can you consider that as major... Wait, any yeah, squad? Did he say squats? Can we see squats <laughs> any in squad? 40k? <laughs> <laughs> so, so a redesign of the Ogrens is... As or a, any squad, yes. It, Stop focusing. <laughs> but they're not all the same, Justin. To go in and redesign the standard Fire Warrior, yeah. right, is is going to have more impact than than the redesign of an Ogren, for example, or a Rattling. Okay, um, uh, there is one other model that has to be redesigned, yeah. and I can't even remember the name of it. What Which faction? faction? The Chicken Walker thing in the Tau. Oh, the battle suits. The battle suits. <laughs> tau battle suits are yeah, they're, they're very weird are looking. Now. Horrendous. Yeah. They are absolutely horrendous. They're they've been weird. they've been horrendous for a while. Yeah, they they could have an amazing, I agree, amazing yeah. upgrade yes. right now. Yes, right. I think we've done that one to death. Yeah, I have no idea now. Just what the hell we were talking about, or what the point was. I'm sure all, it's in there somewhere. All I know is I we have to it. stop focusing. So I'm going to yes. go look off in the okay. distance. Okay. So um, no more, no more focusing. Everything's going to be okay, Justin. Don't panic, man. Oh, I'm not panicking. <laughs> right. We have we have a guest in the studio. Yes. We have had a fabulous time uh, with Rich from Two Fat Lardies. Yeah. So. And Justin has had a chance to to sit down with him to talk about Blitzkrieg 1940. Hey everybody, I have been joined by Richard from Two Fat Lardies to talk about his new book for Chain of Command, which is Blitzkrieg 1940. It is. We're also going to be catching up with Richard since the last time we've seen him, whenever he brought along what a tanker, to see what the guys at Two Fat Lardies have been up to. So, Richard, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, as always. Uh, Blitzkrieg 1940, what have you created for us? Oh, well, um, it's the first of the uh, new handbooks that we're going to be running out for Chain of Command, which has just really given us an opportunity to go into a lot more detail. You know, it's great having a, a set of rules that covers the whole of the Second War, but there are huge changes in the way, uh, the way units were organised, the way troops fought between 1939 and 45. So creating the handbooks allows us to go into a lot more detail, to provide a lot more lists and a lot more support for people playing the different periods. I see. I see. So basically people can get a lot more granular with the forces that they're playing. Absolutely that right. That sounds good Absolutely to me. Absolutely right. Now, mm. uh, you, you were talking to me about mm. some of the, the way the Germans were actually lined up in mm. 1940. Uh, you were saying mm. there was different waves of the armies? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, it's actually. Only, I'm curious about it, so I'm, I'm going to dig into it a little. <laughs> we... We always have this image as war gamers as the Germans being this super uber army and everybody mm. focuses on, you know, just how great they are. Mm. But in, in 1940, it was uh, kind of a case that uh, uh, they weren't really, weren't really ready to go. In 1939, not everybody had been equipped properly. And so what the Germans did is they 
uh, at the end of the First World War, they'd been limited to an army of just 100,000 men, which yes. is really kind of tiny for those times. And they had to expand that and expand it again and expand it again. And what they created was a number of waves. So the first wave division would be really, really well equipped. They'd mm -hmm. have all the toys, they'd have the mortars, they'd have all the equipment that they needed. Uh, the second wave... Uh, not quite so good. And by the time we get down to fourth and fifth wave, they're mm. actually getting the old First World War stuff out of the wardrobe <laughs> and, uh, and using that because they just haven't built all the, the right amount of kit to equip all yeah. those divisions. And also they, they haven't really ha had a chance to get them all completely trained. So yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting when you see the newsreel footages of uh, the tanks and the uh, armoured personnel carriers storming through France. In fact, this is very much a propaganda victory for the mm -hmm. Germans. You know, the vast majority of the, the Hanuman Classic 251 half-track hadn't even been armoured at that point in time and were only really used for towing towing guns. Uh, but, of course, they make great film footage. Oh, yeah. So uh, we uh, we have those images in our mind, which is, a, you know, as I say, a great propaganda victory for mm -hmm. them because it, it, was, uh, it was a case of going to war on a shoestring. Uh, mm -hmm. You get organisations like um, the Waffen-SS where they're equipping their troops with stuff they've captured in Poland because they they literally don't have the the weapons to yep. to to equip them, so it's great to be able to represent all those different units and do it in different ways. And it's quite nice to be able to get my sort of First World War uh, heavy machine guns out and use them with the Second World War figures. It's nice to you know do a few head swaps and whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's all good fun. It creates a totally funky and very very different type of army. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've got kind of all those options in there for from right the way through first wave, almost down to the ninth wave, and then you're into fortress troops in their emplacements who've mm -hmm. hardly got you know hardly got anything. Um, so it's like rifle it, between four men. Yes, yeah, not quite that bad, but <laughs> uh, you know, again, rifles that uh, are pretty much all they're they're restricted to at that point. Mm -hmm. So you do get an opportunity to get a lot more granular. Uh, and it's also interesting to go into other units. Um, so, for example, we've got the Belgians in there, we've got the Dutch in there, mm -hmm. we've got the French in there, we've got the British in there. And it's great to have an opportunity to say, well, you know, is that British unit a regular unit? Are they territorial troops who really were just doing their weekend camps and mm -hmm. getting a bit of training in drill, who'd had no experience with modern, modern weapons at all? And when they get shipped out to France, they spend most of the time digging trenches, which they then don't use because yep. they march into Belgium. And it's great to be able to say, well, it's not just a generic British force. Mm -hmm. It's something um, a lot more specific. Um, so you can decide whether they're territorials and, and how long they've been in France, how much training they've had, yeah. how much equipment they've had. And then there's the opportunity to... Um, uh, to mix and match, so it's it might be nice to have a force of uh, British troops mm -hmm. who are supported by I don't know, a Belgium anti-tank gun or a, yeah. you know a couple of French tanks who've turned up mm -hmm. because in all the chaos. Uh, of that very very frantic period of warfare between May the tenth and the end uh, and the end of May when the British were evacuating at Dunkirk, mm -hmm. you had all sorts of units fighting together who who shouldn't have been fighting yeah. together but were. So there's there's great opportunities to take a British list and select supports from those other nationalities to Very get cool. a great variety on the table. It's just you know who can't like those French tanks or those really mm. really uh, nice camouflage patterns. Yeah. Uh, good fun to have. Well, I. I do have a question, <laughs> mm. and it, it actually stems from mm. a misconception that I mm. recently learned about, and mm. I, I had noticed I myself had fallen into, was mm. that when you think of World War II, you think of the main players. You're thinking mm. Britain, you're thinking America, you're thinking mm. Germany, you're thinking Russia. Mm. But what about all of the, the smaller nations? Because I, I hear mm. you mention the Belgians, the Dutch. Yeah. Having a chance to actually play with those forces and explore mm. the history of them is something that mm. interests me a lot. To actually find out just how they fought and what they would have been equipped with. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree, actually. It was really interesting doing the research for this that uh, uh, we've got about seven or eight uh, different Belgian lists in here, mm -hmm. uh, similar for the Dutch. I mean, uh, rather than me um, sort of make it up, I mean, I can just flick through this. Yep. And, you know, for the Belgians, for example, 
Um, we've got a standard infantry platoon. We've got, we've got a reserve infantry platoon. Now, these guys are wheeling out some machine guns from the 19th century, the type of thing that, you know, almost that, you know, you, you'd have been using in the Zulu Wars type of thing. <laughs> um, so, that, you know, um, but interesting little force. Uh, we've got an infantry scout platoon. We've got the Chasseur Ardennes mm. who, were, who were off in the, uh, in the Ardennes trying mm. to delay the Germans as they advanced. We've got the Frontier Cyclists. These were an Cyclists? El- Frontier Cyclists. These were an elite yeah. Belgian unit on their bicycles. <laughs> really well played. They only yeah. recruited uh, single men or divorced men because their 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 death defying antics on their bicycles <laughs> were gonna were gonna be so um, <laughs> so amazing that they couldn't have married men in there. The risk was far too high. So you've got <laughs> okay. these these fabulous units with big floppy berets, and then you have got like motorized cavalry. You've mm. got cavalry on motorcycles, mm-hmm. and so. Whatever Belgian force you want to fight is pretty much in mm-hmm. here. And the good thing is that each of these units have got their own support list, what mm-hmm. would be pertinent for them at that particular time. So the, the, the Frontier cyclists, for example, uh, get one of the prototype uh, anti-tank guns on a, on a little carrier base which was so unstable that when they fired it, it would fall over. <laughs> so the only way they could use this was by digging it in right. so the earth was all around it to create a stable platform, which isn't ideal if you want to move it 100 yards to get a better view. No, but no. there's some really interesting, but they don't, they're not stuck with using... Were they towing it on the bike? Yeah, <laughs> I've no idea if they were towing it with the bike. No, it, it was actually self-propelled on okay. tracks, but the gun that's on top was a bit too heavy yeah. for the, the, the base. So there's <laughs> some really interesting units but if you've got a frontier cyclist force you yeah. don't have to select that you can go to one of the you could go for example to the cavalry support yeah. list and choose some of the tanks so there is a system that mm-hmm. allows you to really mix and match or as i say you could decide you wanted a french tank or a british mm-hmm. tank to support your belgians yeah. because historically they fought alongside each yeah. other and let's be honest mm-hmm. war is chaos sometimes oh absolutely it's a bit like here <laughs> Thank you. So, Welcome to Ireland. My pleasure. <laughs> uh, yeah, so obviously what we do then is it, it's not just a big book of lists. We've got all the support options in there. We've right. got things like the national characteristics, yeah. which every which are there. Every every nation has got them. They're there to reflect the way that they were trained mm-hmm. um, and, and the way they, they behaved in reality. So the Germans, as, as we remember from last time we played Chain of Command, have got that machine gun bonus, oh, yes. where, and they've also got the... Uh, the uh, hand granat and a storm trooper attack, which they mm-hmm. learned from their fathers. So you, each nation has got its own specific um, national characteristics. It explains all the support options, mm-hmm. and then you've got their own armaments table as well. Mm-hmm. But more than that, we've also got a load of new rules in there um, for all sorts of things that uh, happened in 1940. Obviously, when you write a set of rules, mm-hmm. you are dealing with what's normal. Mm-hmm. So you're dealing with firing and movement and all the kind of usual things. But when you get uh, into more detail in a handbook like this, mm-hmm. it gives you an opportunity to look at things um, that are more period-specific because mm-hmm. that campaign is really um, quite unique. You wouldn't apply some of the things that were happening there um, to 1944. Mm-hmm. So we've got unreliable allies, what we were talking about a minute ago, mm-hmm. um, where if you are... Um, selecting a, a British tank to support your French unit. Mm. They're not unreliable because they're rubbish. They're just unreliable because they happen to turn up there in the chaos. Mm-hmm. And at some point in the game, they might get a radio message saying, actually, headquarters has shifted. We're 15 miles down the road. Come and join us. <laughs> but, of course, selecting an unreliable ally is quite cheap. So there are times when they're going to stay all game mm-hmm. and there are times when they're not going to stay all game. So it's a little risk reward. Yeah, that's right, a risk reward, exactly. Mm-hmm. So we've also got other things in here, such as bicycle-mounted troops, mm-hmm. which you clearly get excited about. I'm I can curious see to see how this looks in miniature. Yeah. <laughs> Horse-mounted troops, mm-hmm. motorcycle-mounted troops. Mm-hmm. We've got assault boats and rafts. You've got Ooh. lots and lots of rivers in Holland and yeah, Belgium, yeah. and the Germans like to get in their inflatable boats and paddle across. I see. So uh, you've got to allow for that, mm-hmm. and there's some great modelling opportunities in there as well. Yeah. Um, not as in sort of knitwear <laughs> modelling, but, you know. Um, no, what, that <laughs> look fashionable? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Well, you might carry it off, mate. I don't think I would somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got... Assault boats and rafts in there. 
Uh, then we've got things like airborne operations. Now, ah, ha ha, exciting stuff. It's great, isn't it? One of the fun things is when you look at um, a bridge too far and the British uh, mm -hmm. at Arnhem, where they're putting in their their carpet of paratroops that the tanks are meant to drive over, mm -hmm. and everybody goes, "Wow, that's an audacious idea." Well, it was, but the Germans did it in 1940 in Holland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they did it the other way around, and they were very, very successful at dropping their parachute the paratroopers onto some key bridges and then the panzer divisions zoom through to link up with them so you've got to have rules in there for uh, parachute landings mm -hmm. and of course you have the glider landings in belgium places like ebene mm -hmm. where they landed right on top of this great big fort and then rather surprised everybody um <laughs> so we've got rules in there for glider landings do you have rules for the gigant for the what gigant uh no Oh, oh. Um, sad panda. Yeah. So we've also got combat engineering, mm -hmm. talking of which, so fortifications, so like the Maginot Line mm -hmm. and like the um, you know the Belgian forts, because the Belgians were reliant a lot, like most people were at that time. I mean, Hitler was building the what we call the Siegfried Line, the West Wall in Germany. Mm -hmm. All, most countries in Europe were reliant on big fortification fortified lines. So we're taking into account the fortifications. We're taking into account how demolition because a lot of um a lot of british and french and belgian troops were attempting to delay the germans by blowing up bridges blowing yeah, up culverts and stopping them uh advancing on the main defensive line so all of that is in there so we we've been able to introduce a whole raft of new rules which actually in some cases you could lift out and apply in other areas mm -hmm. so for example the paratroop and glider landing mm -hmm. rules you could apply at Arnhem because yeah. a parach parachute's a parachute and yeah. glider's a glider, so you can do that. But it has allowed us to go into that much more details, which you can't put in the main uh, mm -hmm. main rule book. Otherwise, you'd have yeah. a book about 500 pages long. Yeah. And, and I'm guessing this is more of rules integration very than taking so. over from it. Yeah. It's, it's one thing you guys do yeah. very well with your rule mm -hmm. set. You always mm -hmm. keep everything nice and clean for everyone to play mm -hmm. with. There's, mm -hmm. there's nothing saying you need to check book five and a series of six oh, to supersede a rule in the main rule book no i like the fact that you guys don't do that yeah yeah well it's uh i think it's important to be able to keep things as neat and tidy as possible i mean you know uh, chain of command has been out for five years it's hugely popular and there are one or two areas where if i'm honest that i would say okay um don't quite do it like that do it like this mm. which i think happens with anything that's five years old but that's mm. very very few and far between and certainly yeah. none of the core mechanisms are affected yeah. in that way because yeah. it's it's one thing i always mm. say as soon as mm. a rule system hits market that's mm. uh, you've had your beta test before yeah, yeah. that's the real test it is, is yeah whenever you have thousands mm. and thousands of people playing the game and actually seeing where are those little loopholes, where are the, yeah. the little things where yeah. what you've maybe written down and intending yeah. it a certain way yeah. doesn't translate. No, well, the English language is an imperfect language, you know, which is why, um, you know, if, if, you, if you're wanting to write a scientific paper, you should really do it in German because their language is a lot more precise than mm. ours. Um, but uh, so you, you do get a situation where, you know, something is perfectly clear to you and perfectly clear to 101 other people, but, yeah. but five people might read it as being the opposite. Yeah. So but you're always going to get that, and as a rule lawyer, you you have to be aware that that's potentially going to happen. But we try and keep it as clear as possible, and certainly yep. the You've core mechanisms job. are pretty simple, mm -hmm. pretty simple, um, but not simplistic, obviously. Of course. Yeah. So a whole raft of lists. There's about sixty different armies you can choose in here. Wow. With about. It's either five or four more or five or four less. So mm -hmm. let's say 60 other different mm -hmm. um, uh, support lists. Mm -hmm. So the choice in terms of creating a force that you want to game with yeah. is huge. And the nice thing is, to be honest with you, if you've got a Dutch force, mm -hmm. that could be infantry or it could be cavalry, mm -hmm. or it could be motorcycle. The yeah. only thing that's really different is a little bit of coloured band around around the wrists on their yeah. jacket. Um, but I wouldn't worry too much about that. So mm -hmm. if you buy a, a Dutch army, um, you can feel that as almost any one of those armies on that list. If you buy a German army, we talked about there being like nine waves, yeah. and and then the, uh, the support troops. If you buy first, create a first wave German division force, 
which is a platoon of four squads, 50 mil mortar. Mm -hmm. You can then just drop a, uh, if you, if you, a second wave, for example, is three squads with no 50 mil mortar. Well, you can use the same figures for that. Yeah. Um, and if you want to change it whereby you're using um, uh, some of the First World War kit, just mm -hmm. buy a couple of figures with a bit of First World War kit, and you've completely changed it. Yeah. One of the weapons that they use um, is the uh, MG15, mm -hmm. um, which actually looks, if you just look at the barrel, is almost identical to mm -hmm. an MG34. Yeah. It's the bits down here where the guy's holding it that you can't see that are different. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, you don't even need to change your figures. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I quite like having some really weird and slightly different figures on the table. You see, I, mm -hmm. I know some, mm -hmm. some people love miniatures to be mm -hmm. precisely exact whenever they're mm -hmm. playing World War II. Yeah. It depends on who your opponent is. If yeah. you're both okay, with you know mm. fudging the look just as a smidge yeah, so you yeah. can play the game and play with that rule set yeah, i see yeah. no problem with no, it. no no I, I totally agree with, i yeah. totally agree with you i mean i i like making funny little figures i mean i mm. i happen to have a first world war machine gun team and i just cut the first world war german heads off and put some some of the wall of plastic ah, heads on that's clever. absolutely the wall of plastic stuff is fabulous for doing little conversions mm -hmm. but does the German helmet look that much different? Not really. If you if you don't look too carefully at it, mm. you, you know you could use those First World War figures without much without any change, mm. or just use your MG34 and say, well, it's the earlier model. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, but there's so there's a, there's a great opportunity for huge variety in there without actually having to buy a vast number of, of different figures. Yeah, yeah. That said. There are some great um, figures out there. Um, uh, certainly, there, there's no shortage of um, uh, stuff for the French and the British, which yep. is really good. Um, Warlord produced some really nice stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you go to companies like Crusader, really super motor French motorcycle troops that I'm absolutely in love with, and companies like May uh, May Forty Miniatures in Holland who do their own range of Dutch. So all the figures are out there. Um, it's uh, uh, just an opportunity to to paint up an army and use it for all different types of troops. Mm. Because you, you've, um, you know, there's as I say, sixty lists in there, which gives you a great amount of choice, and five new exciting and very nineteen forty esque scenarios as well. I was well. about to ask if you had scenarios in there. Yeah, um, we when we wrote the main uh, chain of command rules, we were very very keen to create six scenarios mm -hmm. which can almost cover any aspect of warfare. So the first game is a patrol, meeting of patrols in no man's land. Yep. The next scenario is is an attack on the outpost line. The next one is an attack on the main defences. Then the next two are kind of breakthrough scenarios. And then the final sixth one is the attack on the ultimate objective. Yep. So those scenarios really work in any number of different um, uh, different environments. You mm -hmm. could use them for any period. Uh, but the ones in here that we've done, actually, we've got five scenarios. We've got uh, Going With a Bang, which mm -hmm. is a great fun one, um, where the uh, Allied side are trying to do some demolitions to slow down the Germans. Mm -hmm. So this could be the Chasseurs Ardennes in Belgium, mm -hmm. who are maybe blowing up a bridge or two to stop the German tanks getting through. Or it could be British engineers or French engineers or Dutch engineers blowing up a, just little road culverts and things yep. like that. Then we've got Strike from Above, which is all about airborne landings mm -hmm. and how that works. Then we've got Swift to Support, which is about a smaller force trying to hold out while reinforcements are being sent. Mm -hmm. So that's a kind of breakthrough scenario, as is the Hasty Defence, mm -hmm. which again is the Germans really pushing on with the Allies trying to get their defences together on the hoof. And then we've got Blitzkrieg, which is the final one which kind of, as the name suggests, is a case of really trying to steamroll a punch through. Yeah. yeah, so five really good scenarios. Mm -hmm. and, and every one of them could be used anywhere in, in France or the Low Countries in 1940. But what yeah. we've said is this scenario would be great for this type of situation. So yeah. we've got some guidelines in there uh -huh. for when people might want to want to use those ones. But all in all, it's kind of a really um, one-stop shop for yeah. France and the Low Countries. And we've got Italy as well. Italy oh. are in there because they, yes. it, they invaded um, 
uh, southern France in the very final days of the campaign because mm. Mussolini, Mussolini said to his generals, I want you to get me 30,000 men killed so I can get to the peace conference. <laughs> and so they decided to attack through the Alps and they kind of got frostbite <laughs> and went home and had a really bad time of it. <laughs> but we put them in there for completeness sake. But I think you would probably have to be a lunatic to um, want to refight that particular part of the war. Even yes, I'm... Yes, yes, which army I'm going to <laughs> Even I'm not tempted to get an Italian army to have frostbite and, and a mountain pass in the Alps. Um, uh, whereas all the other ones I'm building forces for. And mm -hmm. uh, So, yeah, that, but that's just me. <laughs> well, the, the big question is, mm -hmm. uh, you guys love exploring World War II. This yeah. is for 1940. Are mm -hmm. we going to see you moving on through the different years of the war for other books like this? Yeah, we are. Yeah, we're going to. This is just the first of them. We're working at the moment with a gentleman um, uh, from the Jungle Warfare mm -hmm. um, um, School uh, in uh, at the Australian Army. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we're working on a, a Far East one to Ooh, go with this. So we're yes. going to be. We're not just going to be covering the uh, the obvious stuff. We're going to be covering China as well. So we've got Burma, we've got Singapore, we've got the island hopping with the uh, U.S. Marines. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the whole of the Far East um, that we're going to be covering there. Obviously, the Australians fighting yeah. uh, their own battles there against the well, Japanese. The Japanese almost made it to Australia. Yeah, they did. Which a lot of people don't really yeah. realize because yeah. you never hear about the Japanese campaign. No, no, exactly. And it's uh, when the uh, uh, gentleman who's the commander officer of the jungle warfare school down there said uh, you know he was really interested in uh, working with us on it and mm -hmm. he's done he's done an awful lot of research um, on the period and obviously with his own particular expertise oh, in yes. uh, jungle warfare he's kind of the man that uh, we we want to be working with so that's going to be the next one mm -hmm. we're going to be rolling out others um, the majority of them are going to be in hard copy like this. Mm -hmm. There are going to be some where we're just going to be releasing it in PDF. Now, it's, for example, the campaign in Denmark mm -hmm. and the campaign in Norway in 1940 mm -hmm. are really interesting, but they're, they're not real headline-grabbing things. But we are going to be covering those and producing them in, in a PDF format. Mm -hmm. But uh, the majority is going to be in this. Uh, we're going to go for as I say, the Far East. Mm -hmm. Then the next one is going to be Blitzkrieg in the East, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be covering um, 1941 all the way through to Stalingrad. Yeah. And then we're going to be rolling that out. So we're obviously going to be doing moving then through into mid-war, late war, mm -hmm. other stuff as well. But the, the whole of the war is going to be covered in, in a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. um, it's... Um, uh, I think we all, as war games, we all love lists, mm -hmm. and we love looking through them and thinking, "Oh, if I get another three figures, I've yeah, got a whole yeah, new yeah, army yeah. for the cost of like five pound." <laughs> and it's nice to be able to, you know, just jiggle things a little bit and get totally different units because these guys fight in such different ways. Yeah, yeah. You know, some of them are very First World War in their mentality, mm -hmm. um, whereas others are a lot more into fire and movement mm -hmm. um, and a lot more modern. And the the equipment. And uh, the capabilities sometimes don't quite marry up. Mm -hmm. So you can have troops with, with really good kit who don't really know how to use it, but you mm -hmm. can equally get really good troops who don't necessarily have the right uh, kit. They, they have a rock and a stick. Yeah, <laughs> and and the technology is such that the tanks aren't these sort of lumbering giants mm -hmm. that everybody is scared to death of because they're a little bit more like a dustbin on wheels. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's fun. That's it's, fun. it's something myself and John here in the office talk mm. about all the time is mm. the, the early tank tactics and the actual mm. schools of thoughts that were used yeah. for tank warfare at the beginning of World yeah. War Two. There was so much catching up to. Oh, absolutely. The Germans picked up really mm. goddamn quickly oh, yeah, getting yeah. Blitzkrieg yeah, underway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they, mm. they weren't really the first ones to do it because you mm. also had the Soviet concept of deep battle yeah, which did, was yeah. essentially the same thing. Yeah, yeah. If I, if I remember correctly, yeah, I could yeah. be talking at my back end here. No, <laughs> deep battle is, yeah, pretty much a similar thing. Mm. But yeah, I, I, it, it's intriguing in the rules when you look at the French and everybody goes, wow, the French had fabulous tanks and they were really well armoured and they were really good. How did they lose? And then you think, actually, the tank commander is in his one-man turret. Yep. He's commanding the tank. He's loading the gun, he's aiming the gun, he's, he's firing, firing the gun. gun. Yep. And when you look at the Germans with their multi-man turrets, yep. so their tank commander is just commanding the tank, yep. how much more nimble, how much more effective are they? Yep. And it's really important, I think, if you're going to represent that period, not just to focus on the armour mm -hmm. thickness and the penetration capability of the gun, but to understand the way they fought. Mm -hmm. And then you really can see 
why, whilst the French have technically on paper very good tanks, why they weren't as good yeah. as they, they thought. And funnily enough, some of the designs that they abandoned and didn't use with, with multiple manned turrets yeah. turned out to be some of the best tanks of the war because the ones they had, they had in storage. Yeah. And they only bought them out late in the, in the day after Dunkirk. Yeah. And then they're, they're going, oh, actually, these are quite good. Why didn't we make more of them <laughs> instead of those rubbish ones over there? Yeah. So it's, it's really interesting to... Um, to examine and explore that by playing games with slightly different forces. The mm. the one I'm really mm. curious to explore whenever the, mm. the, the supplement mm. comes out for mm. it is going to be mm. the early war Russians. Yeah, Seeing yeah. that initial idea of mm. one man carries the rifle. Mm. When mm. that man dies, the mm. man without a rifle picks mm. it up. No, yeah. I'm super curious to see how you guys well, model that inside it's, the game. It's Not to mention be, the, the mm. horde with the deployment tactics that you yeah. actually use in Chain of yeah. Command. It's, um, it's, it's really interesting because the one thing that the, the Soviets are really good at is reinventing themselves. Mm -hmm. They are not hidebound by tradition. Mm -hmm. So they don't say, I sailed, chap. We've always done it that way. So we're always going to do it that way. They say, well, that ain't working. What can we do to improve it? Mm -hmm. And they are much more... Um, they're much less self-conscious about the way they do it. They go, right, let's change it, let's do it. When they invaded Finland in 1939, they were spanked rotten yep. for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then they said, stop the war for a month while we retrain and mm -hmm. develop new tactics. And they did. And they came back and they effectively won that. So it, it's that's something that um, that most armies aren't capable of doing um the, the big problem with most armies trying to do that is whenever you're making those changes you are risking mm. lives mm. yeah and yeah if, if you're willing to expend those lives mm. to change your tactics you mm. can have what the russians had which was well, that very quick and adaptive that's the great advantage of communism isn't it when you're not worried about people's lives oh, harsh one, but you know it kind of works judgmental but yeah yeah no well i mean stalin wasn't really known as being a sort of you well, know, he had the purchase yeah he did and he 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 certainly had the same attitude as Napoleon, you know, what do a million lives matter compared mm. to me? Um, and he was prepared to, you know, risk those different ideas and concepts to see if they worked by um, using human beings as, um, you know, a, a laboratory rats. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting dynamic there, which... Um, Probably needs addressing in the in the handbook when well, we cover I'm, it. I'm very curious to see how you actually model it because the Soviets, mm. you, you're going to have mm. big units trying mm. to come out of your deployment zones, yeah. and actually mm. the way you figure out your deployment zones, mm. I have to wonder: do you maybe give the Soviets an extra mm. one just because yeah, they're going possibly. to have so many men, yeah. things mm. like that? Yeah, possibly. That's, that's... It's what's good is that we're starting to see a lot more books written in the Russian language now being translated into English because we've always in this country, tended to have a very German-centric view mm -hmm. of uh, the, the war in the East, the yes. Eastern Front, because um, nobody reads Russian, and, and the Russians during the Cold War were not you know, sending oh, books yeah. over here to be reviewed. Yeah, yeah. Or if they were, they were written in a very, very um, uh, propaganda-type yeah. fashion to show how great the, um, the, the, the workers and peasants mm -hmm. uh, had, had it. Um, now we're seeing... Certainly, more honest appraisals. I wouldn't say that, that all that element of propaganda is gone because yeah. the, the Russians are very, very proud people as of a course, nation, of course. and they're they're um, you know inclined to look for you know heroism where where it was there. So, but we are seeing more books. In fact. Um, I've actually just ordered a load in anticipation of doing the research, and nice. it's it's been great to get a much greater selection of of Russian authored books, mm -hmm. and I think that 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 is going to allow us to produce stuff that is a lot a lot more um, representative of the reality of war in the Eastern Front, because there you get so many books which are really mm. written from a very very. Uh, almost pro-Nazi point of view in some respects, and you think, well, that ain't good history. Mm. Well, it's, it's, it's what you always see. Whichever mm. source you're working <clears> from <throat> is always biased toward yeah. whoever's writing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, So getting, getting views from mm. multiple mm. sources from yeah. each of the countries to write them from yeah. their own perspective, yeah. even that, you're still having to balance what they're saying. Cause they're oh, you are, yeah. If you're like, writing a book about your experiences, you're never going to say I was a complete idiot and got everything wrong, are you? Well... <laughs> 
you know, I think I've made one or two admissions on video. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we are. But yeah, no. So it's um, yeah, it's 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 important to do the research. I mean, of the, the, this this took me nine months research. Yeah. Um, and That's I, the fun of it. Uh, it is. I I enjoy it. Um, it's it's interesting because I can I can read a bit of Dutch mm -hmm. and I can speak a bit of French and German. Mm -hmm. How I'm going to get around when I'm fortunately I've got the guy who speaks a bit of Japanese. Uh, How I'm going to deal with the Cyrillic alphabet is going to be an interesting <laughs> challenge. But um, you yeah. just need a lot of decoder ring. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well that's right. But yeah, no. But it's all good. That's part of the fun. That's certainly part of the enjoyment I get. And it's great when you get get the game on the table and you go, ooh, wow, that really feels like 1940. Mm. So. Well, there's there's a question for everybody mm. at home then. Mm. Which era of the war are you most looking oh. forward to seeing the guys at Two Fat Larnies tackle? I want to hear below mm. what it is. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, aside from doing all mm. the fabulous work on this, mm. what else have you guys been up to? Because last time you were here, you had what a tanker. How did that go down with everybody? Oh, my Lord, that's been... Uh... That's been fabulous. The reception has been great. And what we really, really enjoyed seeing about that is people running the games at war game shows and conventions and youngsters getting involved in playing the game. I have had so many emails from people saying, I've got my wife playing wargaming for the first Result. time ever. And you think, yes, that's great. And, and my daughter and her boyfriend are coming around and I'm introducing them to what a tanker. Nice. People, I don't think people would do that with Chain of Command. But, you know, much as I love Chain of Command, it's a little heavy. It's, it's, it's not a game that you would use to, you know, introduce your mother-in-law yeah. to wargaming, whereas oh. what a tanker probably is. Um, yeah. Well, you see, it's, it's one of those things. I've actually considered trying mm, to get mm, my family into mm, to gaming, into like board gaming, yeah, and things yeah. like that. And mm. what a tanker! It does make sense because mm. all they have to think of mm. is, mm. I have one tank. I am yeah. controlling one yeah, tank. Yeah. The level of abstraction is low enough. It's yeah. low enough hurdle for them to step over quite happily without going. What do you mean? I've got half an army moving across the tabletop. How mm. do I make him shoot? How do I make him move? Yeah, yeah. No, that's right. And funnily enough. They can then go, oh, I could buy a tank and yeah. paint it myself. Yeah. You know, it's green. <laughs> and well. and to get somebody into the hobby, mm. you you want to set the entry threshold as low as possible, of really. Course. And that is a fabulously low threshold. Mm -hmm. uh, one plastic tank. Yeah. One plastic tank. Yeah. Build it, paint it, go. That's right. It's, so that's been kind of why uh, John's missus has a pink panther. Right. It's actually pink. <laughs> well. What of me going, yeah. I know a song about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we, wow. I mean, we've we've really been busy with that. Mm. Um, it. I was over. We had a, a really hectic year with uh, shows, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been doing an awful lot of games days around the country, uh, from Edinburgh to Exeter, and all points in between, mm -hmm. um, which has really, really kept us busy. We had a fabulous salute where we were running uh, two games there. Uh, what a tanker and our sister company riser express were doing a big napoleonic game with yep. the author dave brown um and i was over in historicon in the states in ah, the summer I'd which like was fabulous uh the Lard America group over there, um, the guys who Lard America. Uh, Lard America. I've even got a Lard America shirt. That's right. Okay. Make Lard great again. That's <laughs> what I say. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. My hands are too big. Right. <laughs> but, uh, um, but, yeah, the guys out there who are um, <laughs> coordinating, uh, yeah. shall we say, the uh, the Lardy representation at the HMGS shows because the Historical Miniatures Gaming Society, I think, yeah. run the real big shows over there. So you've got Cold Wars and you've got Fall In yeah. and you've got Historicon. And um, the Lard America team are putting everything together. So we had about 20-odd games, official games on the program. Um in the in the main hall there um with you know, lots of nice signage and everything so we had loads of games on there which was great to to get over there and support them mm -hmm. and meet all the um all the u.s lardies out there uh, have a few beers with them and then have a few more beers with them mm -hmm. and then a few more beers with them you, you see uh, this like it's a problem yeah well that was quite funny actually we were in a bar and they came out with the tabs for everybody and they uh -huh. go right two beers and oh that's me and three beers there and the girl goes uh 
And I've got two here with 11 lagers. They went, that's the Brits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, no, great time. Absolutely mm. great time out there. The American conventions are totally different to flavors, so historical war yeah. shows. And they're more like a convention like uh, um, Spiel or Yeah, they're like a bit that. more flash. They're four days long, so much more intensive. Yeah. And, yeah, all bells and whistles and constant gaming. Mm. But the good thing is you... I always think, well, you know, a whole day of gaming is a bit like having a bottle of wine. Yeah. Uh, just two days of gaming is a bit like having two wine, two bottles of wine. It's better. Yeah. But then you get to point three. Do you really want three or four bottles of wine? You know, the wheels I are starting. I know some starting. folks who wouldn't say no. <laughs> the wheels are starting to come off for me at that point. <laughs> but the good thing about a U.S. convention is you don't feel obliged to be there all the time. Mm -hmm. You don't feel obliged to be gaming all the time. There's painting workshops, airbrush yeah. workshops. I picked up some tips from a guy there because I'm about as, you know, I'm not sure use a hammer as use an airbrush when I'm painting my figures. It just yeah. doesn't work for me. So the guy there gave me a few tips, which was really great. And they've got, obviously, the sales area, and they also have like a big lecture thing where people are talking about cool. whatever they're talking about. I think they call it the academy or yeah. the university or whatever. Yeah. The, but, the only reason I think I miss Historicon yeah. most years is because I've done Gen Con just before. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Because one kind of, comes off the back of the other yeah, pretty damn quickly. Yeah. No, it does. So they're, they're good, and you can, dip, you can dip in and mm -hmm. dip out when you want. Um, and... Uh, so that that was that was kind of the the big event of the year. Yeah. I keep um, I keep promising to go down to uh, CanCon in Australia, mm. but uh, that's, that's a long it's a long walk. Australia. Yeah, Oof. it's a long walk. Yeah, um, it was it was it was far enough going to America, but yeah. But, yeah, but that, let, let's not forget Australian yeah. customs. Yeah. What what what's all this this metal you're bringing into my country? All oh, right. Yeah, what well. is is this <clears throat> is this safe for my environment? <laughs> but. Yeah, so that was good, and uh, we've just come back from, where the hell was it? Belgium and Holland. Oh, we uh, went over for Crisis, which is my favourite show of the year. One of the reasons is it's kind of the last show of the year, mm. so it's kind of signing off at the end of a hard hard year, which yeah. is great. And we went out there, picked up a trophy for the um, best um, participation game, which is which was brilliant. But nice. we also had a chance to do Arnhem. So we did a bit of a battlefield tour. Nice. We started at the bottom where 30 Core started, and we worked our way up through Eindhoven and uh, Nijmegen and on to Arnhem. Uh, and one of the things we're going to be looking at for Chain of Command is doing a supplement, not a handbook, but a supplement because it's just specifically focusing on that vet, even tighter than than this. Yeah. It's just that one sort of uh, market garden operation, and we're going to be producing that in uh, next year, early part of next year, Very and that's going to allow us to focus even more, go into even more detail. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, we did a road trip oddcast, uh, part of a, we, we do an irregular podcast, which we call the oddcast, mm -hmm. because it comes out at odd times. Yep. Yeah. It's good, isn't it? To, yeah, to, to, I see what you did there. Our marketing department worked hard on that. And, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and you can listen to that and hear about our road trip to Arnhem, which is um, you know, possibly of interest. Yeah, it could be a lot. In, in amongst discussing beer and things like that. It's, it's, it's one thing yeah. I find historical mm. gamers love hearing other historical gamers chat about their thoughts, their ideas about the, the tactics, the history and stuff. Yeah. And then it gives them a reason mm. to argue on the internet. Mm. Oh, it does, yeah, that's right. Yeah, oh, it's, I'm quite happy for people to say, Clark, you got it wrong again. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, no. So it's good to be able to combine. It's been a busy year, but it's good to be able to to combine that mm -hmm. opportunity for historical research yeah, along yeah. with going to all the different gaming events we go to and we're kind of now at the stage of the year where we're on a bit of a wind down yeah. and I'm thinking about what we're going to be doing next year we start our first show at uh, Panath just outside Cardiff at the mm -hmm. end of January and the next day we, we're at Bristol Independent Gamers mm -hmm. uh, for a big sharp practice weekend they're oh, holding there nice. which um, is going to be great this is the second one uh, mm -hmm. they ran it last year to start with and they've had a number of events there but this is the second year mm -hmm. in a row for this one um so it's going to be busy times um and lots and lots on the agenda lots of new stuff we're thinking about mm -hmm. looking at a set of ancient sharp practicey type rules Ooh, i quite fun. like the idea of you know a little um a 50 or 60 romans escorting the mm -hmm. pay chest through the forests and the hairy germans jumping out or even germans who aren't hairy 
you know, there's there's nothing wrong with that. You could also do a, a bit of Romano British if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, absolutely with the right. Coming down from the north. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, that's right. Always have a bit of picty fun. You know, there's nothing wrong with a big angry Scotsman coming down with nothing but a bit of blue paint on him. No, well, it often happens. <laughs> um, but yeah, so lots of things we're thinking about, um, and lots of stuff in the pipeline with uh, with chain of command. So next year's looking to be. Um, as hectic uh, as this year, if not more so. We Good do, problems to have. Yeah, yeah, we get more and more of the Lardy Games days popping up and uh, they say, can you come along? And I say, yes. So we've had new ones this year in Yorkshire mm-hmm. and Harrogate and uh, Exeter, I mentioned, was a new one mm-hmm. in Chelmsford. So all over the shop, really. I see. I assume, mm-hmm. all right, mm-hmm. we're going to have to link in the mm-hmm. show notes below the the Lardy's home for their forums. Yeah, yeah. You have it, on the forum, there's a big section there. Mm-hmm. I think it's called the ambassadors reception Mm -hmm. which talks about all the events we're going to with the ferrero rocher ah i see all right well uh we'll we'll have to get that linked in the show notes below richard it's Mm. always a pleasure i think we've we've covered everything you wanted or is there anything we missed no no i think i think we've covered everything haven't we really always a pleasure sir thank you for coming in everybody get those comments in below where do you want to see chain of command go for one of the supplements in world war ii Mm. what do you think of the idea of doing some uh, sharp practice ancients we'll move on we will see you again very soon i am absolutely loving the idea behind this book being able to actually have a look at some of the lesser known or seen factions of world war ii playing the dutch for instance i yeah. love the idea of going in and exploring what they would have had in 1940 at the start of the war when germany invaded mm. yeah do you know what um, I, I was just going to say it's an interesting thing actually because there was a, a company recently that's been looking at producing a lot more models for those fringe factions mm-hmm. uh, i think it's a uh, cromlech are doing their own sort of historical range and i did post yeah, a question to the community asking them about kind of what's going to be happening and would you play as some of these slightly more fringe and I don't want to use the word less popular but that kind of phrase about sort of like um, historical wargaming forces so it'd be nice to see more things brought up in that game as well well I mean it's the fact that you can even have like French bicycle troops yes that's that's great apparently elite (laughs) troops yeah. yeah, there's something uh, I, I, I want to raise because a bit earlier in the show, and it's it's been kind of a great on me. I was making a comparison between um, the the World World War Two games yeah, yeah. and 40k. In the World War Two games, there there's a defined story there, yeah. and 40k can kind of write itself. It can change the rules. It can change the yeah, story yeah, as, yeah. It, as it desires. One of the thing I want to make sure that it doesn't come out of that that comparison is that. Um, the, the this the the forty k story it, it looks uh, any bigger like there's more to explore mm. because that couldn't be further from the truth no. yeah. because the you take the World War Two story yeah you have a like forty k you have a story that um, hundreds of people have contributed to over thirty years yeah. World War Two, you have a story that a billion people have contributed now to over yeah. um, over the X number yeah. of years it was on and the 70 odd years since. Yeah, well, there was one discovery I made recently about World War Two, which was the Japanese campaign. Mm-hmm. They almost invaded Australia during World War Two. Yeah. And I didn't know that. Yeah, and I so didn't know that either. It's it's finding those moments, those stories that you haven't seen or haven't looked at before in World War Two, which is where I find the real enjoyment of it. Yeah. It it is it is absolutely incredible. Another thing that, that I didn't realize mm-hmm. is that um, Adolf Hitler and Rudolf Hess were sleeping together. What? Yep. Calling BS. No, no, no. Uh, apparently, uh, apparently they were. Uh, um, is this a uh, Channel Five documentary? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was. Uh, Where did you hear this? Some dude on YouTube. Oh, it's and utter it was, <laughs> bollocks! <laughs> Clearly, we know because we're three guys on YouTube. <laughs> um, uh, I love Four guys, sorry, uh, three guys in a computer screen. Right. Okay. I'm leave so before I humiliate myself. I, uh, there, there's there's a couple of things I love doing, right? right. On, uh, and and YouTube is a great resource for this. So there are there are obviously your kind of like your mainstream documentaries and things like that yeah. um, about it, but there are also um, historians out there that um, that go into all sorts of other weird details, right? And they they focus in on you mean like, conspiracy theorists. No, I don't think so. You know, there, there's one um, uh, that I was uh, r- watching recently about the the death of Himmler, mm. and um, uh, the, the evidence for it was actually really, really interesting. So they the 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 official line is that Himmler um, was uh, presented himself to the British. Basically, he surrendered yeah. to the British. Right. They took him into this house, okay, where he was uh, to be questioned. And he was being examined by a doctor. Right. And uh, the the Himmler then uh, cracked a cyanide capsule in his tooth and, and killed himself. Right. Okay. 
and some small number of historians historians kind of doubt that mm. this is what has happened because apparently the body um had quite a lot of bruising uh, and and stuff to it they think he was beaten to death possibly okay um the uh, now they're basing that on on uh, photographs of the body right. and there's there's this great audio tape um of uh, one of the the staff sergeants or something who's who's describing how Himmler died okay yeah. uh -huh. and it sounds exactly like he's just reading it off a page uh -huh. you know it's it's such a prepared statement and it just doesn't it doesn't make an awful lot of sense it doesn't add up um, because you know why would Himmler present yeah, himself, himself give yeah. himself up present himself go through because he actually went through quite a fair bit of um um evasion to yeah. get himself um uh, in front yeah. of the Brits rather than being picked up by the Soviets yeah um uh, to to get there for them for them for him to to commit suicide yeah. so there's the Himmler story which I'm okay. I'm really interested in uh -huh. but there's also the Rudolf Hess story okay and um I'm going to tell you all about that in backstage tomorrow morning <laughs> because it is absolutely fascinating. Okay. I mean, fascinating. Okay. This okay. is some really interesting stuff. Right. Kickstarters, Ben. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we've got one this week, and it's from the guys at Punga Miniatures. And this is for their Canators and Felators uh, range, which is very, very fun indeed. It's got about five days left. Uh, at the time of this going out, which is pretty cool. And uh, it's a whole bunch of four-legged friends that they've turned into fantasy adventurers. So their main focus was on a whole bunch of dogs, and we've seen a couple of these miniatures before popping up from these guys at Punga in the past. They do some absolutely fantastically characterful ranges and stuff. It's really good. But they've recently been unlocking some cats as well into the mix, so you've got some of those thrown into there. All of the miniatures are used for, you know, all your wargaming purposes. So if you want to use them for things like skirmish games and stuff, you've got them there. And of course, there's also the opportunity to use them in role-playing games as well and actually as part of this campaign they've designed a whole bunch of stack cards and a whole bunch of other things that you can use uh to use your dogs in games of dungeons and dragons oh, edition. So, awesome. so you can either use them as enemies or you could potentially just use one of those stack cards to represent your character and play out a little doggy adventure on the tabletop which i thought was really cool um they've got some fantastic sculpts in there as you can see some of them they've already got painted up so you can see what they're going to look like when they get to your doorstep as well some of the interesting stuff that kind of came up in the stretch goals was they have some really cool cats as i said and they've also done like a witcher style hero as well so if you like Geralt, Geralt of rivia yeah. from the witcher series they've got a very very cool version of him there and also they have started to design a whole bunch of um versions of the dogs so that you don't have to add them on four legs you can have them on two legs if you like as well um so they make them a little bit more sort of anthropomorphized into a sort of slightly more humanoid shape which i thought was really interesting i prefer the canator style design <laughs> i think that's pretty cool uh but yeah some really cool stuff in here and i believe we've actually got some of them to to shelf as well so. yeah well i would just uh I would just like to say, hi, I'm Warren, and I do D&D &D doggy style. <laughs> oh! <sighs> Why did we let him go? I'm going to try that one on the wife later on. I'm going to see if uh, if Andrea fancies a bit of D&D &D doggy style. I know exactly what you're going to hear. Be quiet, you. This is going <laughs> to be awesome. Right, do you want to see some doggies? Yeah, yeah let's, let's right. see the doggies. Let's go dogging. Okay, so um, <laughs> Lloyd already me, made that mistake. Let me cut. To, let me cut. To, I've cut to the wrong camera. There we go. Okay, and we got to do it. <laughs> and then they just go. <laughs> there, there's yeah. there's two doggies. <laughs> so we, we have this doggy here the corgi there's a guard. corgi yep okay the corgi guard um uh, no apologies a couple of wee bits that we haven't glued on uh, uh to these guys so the the corgi um stands like he's he's making a sign at justin he needs a wee beer or something there we we corgi beer and then this guy here the pit bull that's that's a pit bull yep. yeah Glad yeah no. Um, so let me let me turn them around because the the actual sculpts the detail is gorgeous beautiful now, I think these would make amazing D and D minis they're fantastic they're really great uh, ones I want Roman to paint up the corgi when yeah. he's next here well he has a corgi exactly in exactly mm -hmm. and uh, I remember when we first showed these off on our news piece uh, there was a little debate over which 
of these characters each represent each of us. I believe, Warren, you were the pit bull and I was the corgi that we have there. It was agreed I, in the comments. I, I wouldn't be surprised by that because then Justin would be a pug. <laughs> no, so I, 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 I think, I think, uh, was it the Chihuahua merchant? No, no, I think you uh, were po probably the Dachshund. A, a, a Dachshund? Oh, the Greyhound, was it? No, the Dachshund. Yeah. Dachshund. Well, I don't see a Dachshund. I, oh, Although well, they do have a pug. Yeah. Uh, actually, yeah, I'll take that. Uh, yeah. No, I have one here, Justin. Yeah. Justin let's pieces. Right. So this one here. Let's let's. I'll show you on the camera. All right. Okay. I think this. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. Amazing, Justin. Look at he stands proud and tall. Oh, Doberman and... Knight. There you go. Let me let me stick his butt on, Justin. Yeah. Right? So. There we go. Doberman, sorry, Doberman. Okay. Yeah. So there he is. Mm -hmm. Look, proud and tall. Yeah. And if you look really closely at the face, yeah. he has that similar expression of, I'm not exactly sure what this conversation's about, <laughs> but I will push my point anyway. So, let's... <laughs> <laughs> so there he is. I see, there there are some me. dogs out there. You look at them, you look into their eyes, and you know there's nothing there. <laughs> Wow, that's a really <laughs> sad thought. Oh, my God. Yeah. oh man, you know it's like you you, you have uh, you have everybody in the dogs trust in the RSPCA looking at the phone, going, "Do we report him or not?" <laughs> <laughs> hey, have you never had a pet that was just super dumb? A pet? Well, <laughs> oh, 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 I see. What you're I see I have done myself. Thank you. Justin, I hate to break it to you, man. It's, <laughs> it's been well, all these years. Well, it's, it's I know okay. my place in the office now. It, it's okay, man. I'll get you a treat. So, <laughs> oh, no, you gave me a mini earlier. So uh, here we go. There's, um, there's some swords and a shield and even a sheath. The scabbard. Yeah. It's, um, it's, these are absolutely beautiful. Yeah. yeah so they are. Look. Everybody needs a bit of doggy in their life, okay? You know, if you go through life and you've never had doggy, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> so this Kickstarter has my seal of approval mm. because I am definitely, I'm going into D&D &D doggy style. <laughs> and I think many of you should join me in that. In fact, we should do a massive Gen Con get together where we all do D and D doggy style. What, are you getting? I on think a plane? Wizards of the Coast would love this. Are you getting on a plane, Warren? Do you know what? If for I Gen, had for Gen Con D and D doggy, are you getting on a plane? If I had enough people, uh, we're, we're going to do D and D doggy style with me at Gen Con. I would do it. <laughs> okay, we need a petition and, like and right I now I would for this. Do it, and we will, we will go and we will go doggy style on D and D. Um, so there you have it. I, the the canators and filators. Can we see some of the cats? I'm not really. We, a we cat did see. Person. We did see a few a of them of the there. Yeah. There. yeah. Let's see some of the cats. I'm. I'm. I'm a dog uh, guy myself. Up, they, they, yeah. they were. They were among the others. Let's see. Okay. I believe they're, they're listed as the emerald set. If you want to find yeah. them. Uh -huh. Every one of those is a dog. Yeah, I'm looking. Yeah, it's. Uh, the, oh, there. there yeah, that was a. That's, that's a dog. That's no, a. Kita. No, no, that's, that's a. Kita. That's a kita. That sounds like a cat, but it's a kit. Here we go. Uh, no, that's, no a that's, Shiba. A Shiba. That, that, that's a dog. Well, Shiba. It's on a that... green background. <laughs> it's on a green background, <laughs> therefore it must be set, a cat. So... <laughs> there's some. There we go. There's yeah. the cats. Um, a main coon pirate. Yeah. A sphinx alchemist. Yeah. The black oriental assassin. And the orange tabby fencer. I like the orange tabby one. That's yeah. Quite cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah. It's um there it's are very cats. puss in boots. There are cats there if pussy's your thing, but for the rest of us there are doggies. What? Oh. That wraps us up almost. Except last week we were giving away a two player carnivale set. And the prize winner of that was on YouTube and it was Chris Ryu. <laughs> um, if... O I E R U. Yes. Um, you have so many vowels in your yeah. surname, man. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you want if you won that, go over to BC, or go over to on tabletop.com, click the contact us menu or click the more, claim a prize. Then click claim a prize and then it'll be listed in there. And then uh, make sure that you've uh, signed up for a free account, fill in the form, and we will get you sorted. Mm -hmm. And remember, this week we're giving away three uh, rampart pledges with Beast of War shields that you can 
stick yeah. onto them to these, make them extra awesome. Yeah, these are $49 pledges plus mm-hmm. their stretch goals. Plus mm. their stretch goals. So uh, to be able to chance that, comment, like, subscribe, and ding the dong. And you can get your petition going if we're going to do doggy style D&D <laughs> at Gen Con. Thank you very much to Ben, to Justin, to Sam, and most of all, thank you to you guys. Um, right, I'm going to prepare my material for Rudolf Hess tomorrow morning. Uh, come and join us. We're going to be talking about Rudolf Hess, and we have Thomas Menes in the studio, uh, because the big discussion tomorrow is about um, what can we do to supercharge our narrative in gaming with, with miniatures. miniatures yeah so we'll see you for that take care guys go ahead and check out our other content on screen now and be sure to check out beastsofwar.com for the latest gaming news and gaming let's plays and while you're at it why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong go on you know you want to click it go on